James chapter 5, beginning in verse 16 and reading down to verse 20. Now, truly, there is a broader context here about uh, the prayer of faith and the sick that are among us. Uh, but I don't feel this morning like getting into that as much um, today. So bear with me as we, as we read these and, and look at some specific part of this text here. It says in verse 16, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converteth him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. That will conclude our reading this morning. That's reading James chapter 5, verse 16 through verse 20. Come to you this morning uh, with a intent, I suppose, um, a goal. Uh, very often, <clears throat> as I throughout the week, uh, study God's Word and try to discover what it is that the Lord would have me to bring before you all. Um, I take that with the utmost seriousness, and obviously there are different reasons that we might bring a message before you, Um, but today I have a singular intent. One that is hinted out in this verse. Um, My intent today is to enlist a certain role. Um, One which, as a church, as a people, as a nation, grows more carnal or interested in worldly things, I would say that this role is the first one to go in a church. It's not a role that if you have a history of old Union Missionary Baptist Church and you see the dates of who pastored and maybe who was a song leader or who was a clerk or treasurer, it's not a formal office. You're never going to have an ordination for this role. You're not going to have meetings or often you don't have a meeting like we did yesterday morning with the deacons and you sit down and discuss these things, but I would argue that the loss of this office or this role in our day is the implications are hard to measure. You know when they're not there. You know when they're there. But very often it's the last thing thought about. And that is the office of a prayer warrior. The office of a prayer warrior. I suppose one of the um, reasons why this, I call it an office, I don't know what you would really call it, but this office is not discussed a lot or aspired to is because it doesn't get any attention. Again, nobody says, we're going to ordain you, we're going to set you apart in the church as this office. But I would say it's something that a person recognizes a desperate need. They recognize the inherent value and power in that activity. And they make it the the object of their interest perpetually. Or in other words, they set their face towards something and they never relent. I think of in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, there are two occasions where Daniel begins to bow and to pray 
And in one of those occasions, I believe it's verse 3, he says that he set his face toward God and he fasted and he got sackcloth and ashes and he prayed to heaven. And the rest of that chapter, or a significant portion of that chapter rather, is devoted to Daniel's prayer. Now, the thing about this office, like so many things in the work of God, is that it can't be shortcut. Now, in truth, we know that when we do anything, we ought to do it as unto the Lord, that when we especially do things for the people of God, that we should have such preference towards our brothers and sisters and care for the work of God that we put everything we can into it. And yet the reality is sometimes we don't. And sometimes that can become a habit among people that perhaps even studying the word to preach for, to you. Maybe I prepared a lot this week and maybe I hardly prepared at all. And perhaps I can, though I would never try to do that, deceive you as to how much preparation in your Sunday school class or your Sunday morning sermon, how much time and attention is given. But I would contend this morning that the act of being a prayer warrior in a church can never be shortcut. The effects are noticeable when a decline has occurred or when people have passed away who held that esteemed position. I hope as I'm already speaking this morning, if you're like me, a person comes to mind. And I think of someone long ago who didn't demand a lot of attention or recognition, and yet there was something about the spiritual vitality that that person had and their relationship with God that was something that I wanted to know more of. I think of the apostles, and he called 12. But then there were seemed to be three that were in his inner circle, that when he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he called these three. When he would go into a room to raise a, a girl from the dead, he called these three. When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he stood off a ways to pray, he called apart these three. And in my mind, these people who are prayer warriors are one of those. And again, this is a human perspective here. I'm not saying this is formal. But from my vantage point, as I would observe this person and the way that they talk to God and the familiarity with which they did that act, it was as if there were many occasions where God had taken them aside and they had conversed together. In the book of Exodus, it tells us about Moses and his prayer life. And it says at one point that he spoke to God as a friend speaketh to a friend. This morning I come with a singular intent today. And that is to enlist, to find, to advocate someone or multiple people. Seek God's calling in your life to be a prayer warrior. We need it. We really need it. You'll notice in our scripture text today that that very oft quoted scripture, and, and perhaps before I even get to that, I might point out the verses after that. Very often, uh, when a person in the scriptures or when a person in modern day are, are called to something. Either by a church, you might have been asked to be a deacon, perhaps to a, an office of a Sunday school teacher, or a calling into the ministry, or whatever the calling might be, 
oftentimes the initial response that I have found in many people who are most qualified is there is a reaction not to do it. And the reason is because they don't feel competent. They look at themselves and they look at people who have held those offices in the past and they say, I'm not like that. I can't do that. I will never be as effective or competent as the people who come to my mind. And so oftentimes people will recoil at even the very thought of attempting to be in a place or a position or a role that someone they highly admire or have done that role effectively have done in the past. And they look at themselves and they say, I'm not qualified. And it's as though the author James here anticipates that response from verse 16. Because he makes this powerful statement in verse 16, which we'll look at here in a moment. But he says, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So in other words, a person of a certain sort, when they set themselves towards prayer, it avails Avails in our day means it accomplishes much. And then it's as though he anticipates the response to that being, that's not me. I can't do that. And so he so graciously, and look at how small it is. He doesn't get into great length. He doesn't spend a whole uh, amount of, uh, even a paragraph trying to, put a disclaimer or or, or put a qualifier on that verse 16. He just reminds us of something very briefly, and then he goes back to his topic. He points to someone and he says, Elijah was a man of like passion just as we are. Now that word passion means nature. Or in other words, what he's trying to say is, Elijah is a man just like me and you. He has the same propensity towards sin, the same degree to which he struggles with weakness. You know, for me, it's always been sort of humorous. I sat on that side of the lectern for years and years and years as a kid. I listened to the preacher, and it always seemed like they had it so put together. And now I'm on this side, and that's laughable, right? And that's the same way like an adult, right? Isn't it Amazing how when you're a child, you look at your parents and you think, they're always right. They always have the answer. They always know what to do. I can remember even growing up in a, in a, in a single mom's home, feeling like if someone broke in, if I was close to her, she could protect me. Now, that was very unlikely. <laughs> but nonetheless, it appeared that way to me. In a similar fashion, it so often appears as though other people are qualified, capable, more spiritual, all these things that we can bring up and we can use to excuse ourselves from falling towards or perhaps pursuing, rather, this calling. And so James reminds us, listen, This man of God who was found on the Mount of Transfiguration, this man of God who we look back in the Old Testament, Testament, and he seems to be the personification of the prophets of old. One who seems to be, in some respect, God uses as a picture of what a prophet ought to be. And yet he reminds us, despite how exalted of a position that he once held, yet in the same fashion, he was a person just like us, subject to our nature, subject to life passions. The reason I like that they use in the King James the word passion is because it gives the sense that it's fleeting emotions, that it gives the sense that it's oftentimes our weaknesses are found in the pass or in the, in the uh, bubbling up of our emotions. And we often make mistakes, as James tells us earlier on, that we often don't bridle our tongue. Why? Because sometimes words come out before my mind can stop them. See, here he uses that word passions as if something just oftentimes would overcome him. It would be too quick. And he says he was a man just like we are. And yet, 
he points to what he accomplished in prayer. This morning, I come before you and I ask you to take into deep consideration setting your heart towards prayer. See, it's a difference. Somebody who's a prayer warrior, and this is a, this is a, a, a role or a, a title that we've kind of made up over the last, I don't know how long. One I heard quite frequently growing up. Perhaps it's not common here, I don't know. But one that I heard quite frequently growing up. And the one thing that denotes someone who is a prayer warrior versus someone who prays is that it's the difference in it being a periodic activity and a lifestyle. Right? Someone who has a lifestyle of prayerfulness, right? For me, the ministry out of necessity now is a lifestyle. It's something that every day I think about. Every few hours, things come to my mind that relate to the ministry in various forms. And I have known also people who had a lifestyle that was set aside and oriented towards recognizing that their primary objective in life was to move things on earth through prayer. You see, because when somebody becomes a prayer warrior, they have through faith accepted certain things about the reality of this life. They don't have to question it. They don't have to convince themselves of it periodically, but they have accepted certain things about the world. And having accepted that, it compels them frequently and regularly towards a certain behavior. See, the first thing they recognize is that God in heaven, he has all power to do everything. No catastrophe, no disaster, no what we call accident happens. And from God's point of view, them be unintentional or something that slipped through his fingers. See, a person accepts no matter how deep the pain, no matter how great the loss, God has it all under control. To be a real prayer warrior, you have to accept that. Because what you'll find in life the older you get, and perhaps some people learn it very early in life, is that there are many things that happen and you can never understand why. You never understand it. And the more you rack your brain trying to find a reason, the more that when you try to solve it from a carnal vantage point, it leads you to deeper uh, uh, confusion and perhaps resentment towards God. Because you say, you know what, all of these things have transpired. Perhaps you plan for 10 years or 20 or 30 or 40 years for something to happen. And every week, every month, you have been slowly working towards that end. And then this unexpected thing happens. And from a carnal vantage point, you say, for 40 years, I planned perfectly. And then this happened. And people whose faith in God is not deeply rooted they'll become resentful towards God. And what oftentimes happens is they just, they just slowly at times just distrust him. And yeah, they might be lukewarm Christians. Yeah, they might use it as an accessory or put it in its compartment. But they could never be someone who truly moves God in prayer. You see, a, something that a person who's a prayer warrior understands further is that when you move God in heaven, he changes things on earth. Or in other words, as we simply put it, God answers prayer. You know, it's a wonderful thing, and you don't hear people say it very much anymore, but I love it when you can hear, there was a brother at the minister school this year who did a devotional on Friday, Brother Andrew Peters, and he got up here, and he was in his lesson, and he was getting going, and at one point in his lesson, he said, brothers, God has shown me something. And I want to show that to you. You don't hear that very much anymore, you know? Like where somebody goes to God 
and they speak with God and he speaks back to them. And they're not hoping that they got an answer. They're not saying, well, you know what? Because I feel like always in mind what happens is this. We pray for someone to get healed. We pray for someone to get better. Then it happens. And in the back of our minds, Satan whispers, well, that could be coincidence. That could be the medical expertise of the doctors in Bowling Green or in Nashville. And so, yes, we can come forward and say, God healed this person. But always in the back of our minds at times, or at least I find myself this way, there being the skeptic coming out. The carnal mind, as Romans tells us, coming out and saying, yes, God permitted it to happen, but the expertise of all the carnal things also caused it to happen. The hard work caused this person to be blessed and successful. There are very few times in modern days that I hear somebody say, you know what? The chances were almost nil. It looked as though all hope was lost. And then this group of people or this person, we gathered together and prayed and we refused to let go. We refused like that man who was calling out to Jesus when he was on the road, that blind man. And he called out, son of David, have mercy on me. And people tried to to, to quiet him down. And what did he do? It says all the more he cried out. And that's exactly at times what is necessary, at least for me in my own mind and heart, when I'm trying to offer sincere prayers to God that I'm I'm calling out to him. And so often I, I feel and I sense the demonic forces pushing against and giving every reason why God's not gonna hear me, why my prayer life is imperfect, why that these things are gonna be taken care of and there's nothing I can do about it. And by inference, there's nothing that God can do about it. And so very often I shy away from pursuing these things in prayer and yet this man he cried out the more thou son of David have mercy on me you see what the people saw was this man undeserving of the attention of one who was greatly known and who had great power and who had great interest from the crowd and that's so often what, that, what uh, causes me to refrain from prayer is I ask the question, look at how I've lived this week. Look at the sins that I've committed today. Look at where my thoughts have been. Look at who I am and the station that I have in life. Why would God ever want to listen to me in prayer? And friend today, if you meet all of that resistance when you're seeking God in prayer, recognize not one bit of that is true. God does not want you to refrain from prayer because of what you are not. That's the very reason he wants you to seek him in prayer. You see, the end desire of my heart is that we would avail in prayer. You know, here the last few months, I've really tried to get to know you all. Coming to some of your houses, talking to you on the phone. Not just the surface level stuff, but you know, get to know some things. And some of you I have not yet, and I apologize for that. I want to. I want to. And what I've learned is that, man, there's some heavy requests upon your heart. You know? Like some of you have kids in church, kids that grew up in this church. And they're not here right now. And I've watched how quickly. The tears come to your eyes when you talk about it. And in your mind, you might say, you know, I'm not going to bring it to the church every single Sunday in, in a prayer request. Because I've bothered them before about it. I bothered the church before about it. I'm saying what you might think. I bothered the church before about it. And we prayed for a little while and nothing happened. So now I'm just going to relegate it to my private prayers that I don't even really talk about to anybody. I've seen some of you concerned about your grandchildren who are one generation removed from being raised in church. With some of you, I can see the helplessness. What do I do? What can I do for them? Because on one hand, you don't want to beat them to death. You know, they'll drive them away. 
And yet on the other hand, I can't help but think that when we got together last Easter Sunday morning, all I wanted to say was, won't you come to church? Their absence is glaring. And so tucked down deep in your heart is always this this prayer request inside. And if you're like me, I have very few of those. But sometimes they're so intimate with me and God that all I have to say is, God, you know. I don't have necessarily perhaps time to get all into it right now. But God, I have prayed it so many times. And all you have to do is allow one fleeting thought and for you to be able to whisper to God, God, you know all of the things that I would articulate in that thought. Please hear that prayer again. And you just set it down and you move on. I've seen some people's at this church their fear about what is ahead. From the best that I can gather, the last generation was a pretty vibrant, full group that by God's providence and grace, some of you older ones were able to grow up together and raise families together. And it enriched this church so much. And you went through the hardships that this church saw. And you went through the difficulties. And you've seen people come and go. And you've seen pastors come and go. And yet you have been here fixed. And over the last number of years, and if I'm wrong in discerning this, over the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a slight, perhaps in some people's minds, significant spiritual waning. And what once was felt regularly in service is now felt vaguely and extremely infrequently. And the embers of it, once in a while, you can, you can begin to sense it. And forgive me if I'm wrong in this assertion, but it seems as though the embers will come and begin to warm up, and then it's as though people will back away. We'll begin to feel the presence of God's Spirit in just a little way, and then people back away. And you look at the generation that is coming on, and you're looking for that next pillar that next Margaret Board or Clifford Hayes or Joe Cottle or those who, for your whole memory, they were there always. They're good and they're bad. They were here always. And they helped guide the church. And you look around and you're saying, where's that person here? And if you're like me, I'm not going to say I'm worried, but I'm concerned. Because as I traveled around the last five years and got to see all different churches and all different groups, I felt like so many of them was right where we're at, waiting for that next generation to come on. And so what I often was able to see by God's grace, allowing me to go and see all these things, was you would see sometimes people say, okay, we've got to get an idea then. Let's try to Force that. Let's try to get these kids interested in coming to church because the rationale was the first thing is we got to get them interested to be here. And so they'd get a horse and pony show. They'd go and they'd, they'd get some activity, an event. And you know, even when I was a kid, it just didn't seem right. I remember one time there was a church up in Indianapolis that started talking about building a basketball gym. I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And I remember just thinking... You know, it just doesn't feel right. I'm not saying there couldn't be an occasion if you have school back there and you want to have a gym. I'm not saying there could not be a, a situation where that might be appropriate, but here's where it's not appropriate, to draw people in. You know? Like, just to get a whole bunch of activity things, just so we can draw people, so we hope the kids will stay. And I talked to a pastor one time who that's what their church did. And he was 15 years after the fact having done that. And he said to me, wisdom being passed down from a man who tried it and it didn't work, said, you know, I really thought like it was going to bring the church together and it was going to 
cause more interest. But then what I found is that once they had an appetite for those things, they just wanted more of it. And when the church wouldn't go that carnal, they went to the First Baptist Church down the road where they could get that. And the deep regret in his voice was unmistakable. Some of you worry about who's going to be those young people among us. Young people, I can tell you this morning, I I concern myself with that. And there's not a week that goes by where I don't call you by name. Most of the time, multiple times in the week. Or sometimes I'll be at work and I'll just think of you. You see, that's what the misnomer about a pastor is. You think you deal with all the important people in the church. That's what I thought as a kid. Oh, no, 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 no. The people of this church, they don't just think about what's perceived as the important people. They think about you. You might be seven or eight years old. Trust me, they think about you. And they pray for you. And they worry about you. See, there are so many prayer requests that are deeply in my heart here in this text. You know, I want to say one more before I go to this text. I'll share with you one of those things in my heart very deeply that's been there for a long time. I grew up, I was born, as they say, um, rocked in a Baptist cradle. I grew up this way. I think when my, actually, I think when uh, I was born, my parents were members at this church. All I've ever known this way. I saw what it was like up in Alaska to be a member at a really small church on a mission field, struggling. It's my faintest memories as a kid. I know what it's like to be a, a member of a, what we would call a bigger church among us, right? 100 people or so, 100 or more. I saw that. I grew up in it. And I joined a church that had a lot of young people. And I felt led to pastor a church. And after pastoring a church, I felt led to join another church that I just came from at Friendship. All I've ever known is God's people. God, by his grace, I've been able to travel to Africa and Oregon and Alaska, and I've seen God's people all over. And what I have, what's, through all of that, the reason I tell you all that is because as early as I can remember, I love God's people. Like I really love God's people all over. And I believe what Jesus said in Matthew 5, like I think they're the salt of the earth. And I have not failed to see their faults and flaws, sometimes painfully so. Sometimes so disappointing you just weep in disappointment over the failings of God's people. And yet, just as a a father will always love his child, someone who is truly one of God's people will always love God's people. And they see the faults and they see the flaws and they may try to be part of changing those things and helping and forgiving and all the things that are necessary, reconciling people who are at odds. And what I see is I've traveled is that, man, we're dying. We're dying fast. I've gone to churches before where I helped them in revival, and then three years later I helped them again, and their church was cut in half. By what? Deaths. And I see it just slowly dying. And at times, it's so overwhelming. That's one of the values of the minister school that I I hope you as a church, and I think many of you do understand, is that so often these battered, spiritually battered men and women from all over the world come here. And they're on the brink of despair. And they're not like us. They don't have good singing and piano playing. They don't have educated Sunday school teachers. And pastors will get up and they lead singing a cappella. And yet they can't even sing on tune. And so their wives sit in the back and they sing as loud as they can just to help their husband because they know he's discouraged. Then he gets up and he teaches Sunday school. 
and he tries again Sunday morning. He remains discouraged week after week after week after week. I care about those people. I love those people. And there's a burden in my heart for God's people to see hope. You know? Like to see one of God's churches spiritually strong. Like see one of God's churches where they're discipling their young people and young people that you're grabbing a hold and you're embracing it and you're pursuing right and you're loving each other and you're ingratiating yourself in such a way in this church that it's easy to discern you intend to be here forever and that every time the doors are opened, you're going to be here. See, part of the burden of my heart is for God's people everywhere to see that God can still do that today. Hope is contagious. It's very contagious. A water in the desert, a light in darkness, that's what God's people today need. I tell you all that to convey to you that's a deep burden of my heart. And I know that, don't, don't mistake me, I, I have no assumption that I have any power to do anything about that at all. I don't. So why do I bring all these things before you this morning? Because the three things I just listed, took 20 minutes to list, can only be accomplished by God alone. That's it. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we collectively got a burden for those things? And we didn't put a time restraint on God what often happens at this point, we begin to think about revival coming up. And so we all get our spiritual energy. Now that's the word here for a fervent. It's the word that we derive from energy. Energeo in the Greek. And so what we do very often is we're, we want to pray and we want to be prayer warriors. So we go like this. That's, our, that's my prayer life, right? I get, get ready for revival. And so two or three weeks out, you know, I start thinking about it more. I start praying more. I start trying to devote more time. Revival comes, and it's been my experience in the past, I get disappointed. Because I feel like, Lord, I prayed for three weeks. I prayed for three weeks, God. And if God's not going to hear me after three weeks, well, then he's just not going to hear me. You know, a prayer warrior, they don't put some time restraint on God. They don't say, God, here's my time tell. Because you know what we find about the Lord is that his perspective on things is so radically different than ours. He sees the world so much different. Let me ask this question. If you've got a lost loved one that's here this morning, you've prayed, you've watched them seek after the Lord many times, perhaps even in this church, and you've wondered, God, why won't you save them? They seem to be so sincere. They seem to be praying hard. You've prayed for conviction and it just hasn't come. But what if God knows something? That he is going to delay convicting them for a while. And the whole time, he means to protect them all along the way. So that at one point, there's going to come a time where we're sitting in service and God's Holy Spirit is going to come and visit us in a mighty way and convict them powerfully. And they're going to begin to seek after God in an intense fashion. And that's going to have an impact on the lost other kids that are in our church. And so God is hearing your prayers all the time. And he is storing them up. And as he alludes to in the Psalms, he is bottling up your tears. He's remembering them and he knows them. And his intent, listen to me this morning, is to answer you beyond what you can currently understand. Because what greater prayer is there than to pray that Chase will be saved? What greater prayer is there than to say, Lord, let everyone in our church be saved? And so God collects Sister Shelley's tears. 
and her prayers, and he bottles them up, and he remembers them. And what he knows is that in his wisdom, he intends to answer her beyond what she is asking. And not only save all of those, but then encourage her faith. For after years of beseeching God, God answers her, and her faith is that much more strengthened and fortified. I don't know if that's what God's doing or not. But what I know is this. His purposes are beyond my understanding and better than my own intentions. And so in my lowly mind, I pray what I know. And God commands me to do that. That I'm to go to him and I'm to pray always with the undergirding in my prayer. Lord, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And if your will makes me feel vulnerable and not listened to, if it causes fear, God, I will still trust you that your will is good. See, prayer always has under effective prayer, fervent, availing prayer, always has built into it, God, if what I am asking is not what we need, I trust you and you alone. Jesus was not beneath that. He prayed that twice. Right? One in the Lord's Prayer, when he prayed things in heaven might be things on earth, and once there in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, Lord, not my will be done, thy will be done. And let me ask you this question. Let's say oftentimes, let's say the will of Peter, whenever he forbid Jesus from Remember in, what is it, Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, Jesus calls him, Satan, get get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Why did he say that to him? For thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of men. If that does not encapsulate my prayer life so often, I don't know what does. Right? I go to God. Hebrews chapter 4 tells me I'm to go to him boldly. That's a hard thing for people to do. Christians, well-intentioned, humbled Christians, it's hard for them to do. But consider it like this. This is how I think of that scripture in in Hebrews chapter 4 where it says to come to him boldly. If my child was dying and I took them to a doctor and the surgeon looks at me and says, oh, we're going to have to do a whole lot of work and it's going to be, and I'm going to have to just cut him wide open. And I'm going to, and they start listing all the things. I'm going to have to break the sternum. And I'm going to, and they begin to to, to, to describe all the things that I would have to do. I would say, doctor, do what you can. Or in other words, act boldly. I am bringing him before you, and I'm saying, do whatever it takes. You know, that same offer is what God gives to us in prayer. God tells us to pray in so much that we would come boldly, that we would offer before him our petitions honestly and sincerely and pray aggressively that God would do all the desires of our heart, that we would not ask amiss, as James says earlier in chapter four, because it's not saying, Lord, I want this house. Lord, I want this car. I'm begging you give it to me because what James here earlier says in chapter four, verses two and three, is that when we ask, we don't receive because we ask amiss that we might consume it on our lust. So we're not talking about those things. We're not talking about carnal desires of our hearts. We're talking about spiritual things that we know God wants as well. God wants all people to be saved, including every person that comes to this church. And so I can come boldly to the throne of grace and present before him my petition for child after child and adult after adult that's not saved. I can go before God not knowing all of the background to why your children are not in church, why they're not raising their families in church, why they're embittered at this church. I can go before God boldly and say, God, despite my ignorance of those things, despite your knowledge of the details of every person's heart and everything that's sinful thing that has ever happened, happened as a part of this church. God, I know your desire is for reconciliation amongst people who are at odds. And so I pray and I beg you, God, bring them back. And I can come boldly knowing that if God knows what would be best is for them to make peace here and then go join somewhere else. That's what God knows. And I'm happy with whatever God wants, aren't you? We're to come boldly to the throne of grace offering him the desires 
of our heart fervently, but then always trusting, God, whatever it is that you want, ultimately, I want your will to be done. Here, I didn't intend to say all these things this morning. This verse, it gives me such hope. The very last part of it gives me such hope because what it tells me is this. It avails much. You know what I like about that? Nowhere that I know of in the Bible does it say any other exercise or any other activity does that. That it accomplishes much. All the deacons meetings in the world, guess what? The Bible never says they're going to accomplish much. I'm not ragging on I'm not saying we don't need to do it. I'm just saying by the authority of God's word and his promise, he promises us that it accomplishes much. And so I come before you today, and here's been my prayer all week. Lord, just one. Please, help to get me out of the way enough that people would see beyond me and beyond the words and beyond the, the tendency of a pastor preaching their congregation and just one person since your calling in their heart to devote their life for this church's well-being in prayer. I have found that oftentimes people who are like that are unorthodox because they take prayer super serious. I heard somebody who was like that had an influence on me. They started doing a prayer journal. Started writing things down. All the things they desire to pray for. But then here's what they told me. They said they don't just write down, you know, David Witte. If I was going to pray for Brother Witte, they don't just say David Witte. They explicitly detail, here's what I'm praying for him about. Here's what I want to see happen in his life. You know what I found after I did that for a little while is when I go to God in prayer, instead of running out of things to say, I found that I didn't have enough time to include everything that was in my heart because I'd go back and I'd read those things over and over and over again. I'd rewrite those things and I'd tweak them some because sometimes God would answer a prayer and then a new prayer request would come up. You see, I found this person influenced me because they took it serious. They took time. They devoted to it. Sometimes in awkward situations, they would ask us to pray. I felt like what wasn't socially normal one time they called me in the middle of the night said can you meet at church I would like to pray and so there I did drove 45 minutes to church got there about midnight and there we prayed this morning a lot of things I was going to say that I didn't I pray God would use his word as he sees fit but my intent remains the same and that is this I hope you will pray to God and see if he enlists you as a prayer warrior. Change will occur. Prayers will be answered. Good will be done. And God's will in heaven will be done on earth among us. The more that people long for that office. Paul told Timothy, it's good for a man to desire the office of a bishop. It's a good thing for a man to want to be a pastor. It's a good thing for a person to say, God, I want to be a friend of yours, but not like your other friends. I want to be in that group. I'll say this. I, I always think when I leave here, I'm so long, and next week I'm not going to be long, so I apologize. Have you ever heard a prayer warrior pray? Have you ever heard somebody, you know, you come into my house, I'm, I guess I'm not a good example. I don't know my house very well yet. If you come into somebody who's Brother Tommy, yesterday I went and saw Brother Tommy. He knew everything I was in his, everything was at in his house. Pictures, where in the picture the people were at, he knew it really well. You ever known somebody who knew their way around prayer? Like you listen to them and you think, wow, they've been there before. And they've stood before the throne of grace. Have you ever stopped praying just to listen? And thanked God that you were able to listen to a transaction between God and man? 
You ever heard somebody do it for an hour? I have. I've heard somebody talk to God for an hour. And not at one time was I hoping that it would end. Not at one point was I saying, man, this guy just won't shut up. Never thought that. The only thing I could think was, please don't end yet. And then have you ever heard that person call your name in prayer? Like when you know they're at the throne of grace and they're talking to God and you can feel them palpably in your presence and then they say your name. I don't know about you. For me, immediately, I almost can't handle it because I know it. Again, my carnal mind speaking, my sinful mind speaking here, I feel like God's so busy with everything else, he doesn't have time for me. But in that one moment when I'm listening to heaven and earth talk, I know God is thinking about me because this person is bringing me before them. And I just pray, Lord, hear them. Please, for just this moment, hear them. I pray God would send some of you, call some of you, burden some of you to reorient your spiritual life. I can't imagine a better way to go out, you know. Some of you that are older, you're in retired life now. Frankly, you have a little more time than some of us younger ones do. I have good intentions at times. Sometimes I just can't carry them all out. You know, I just don't have time. What if you took it upon yourself and said, you know what? I'm going to retire early for the welfare of my church. And I'm going to set myself towards prayer. Or in my retired days, every morning, whatever your time of the day is. I like mornings. Any time of the day, you say, you know what? This time is tucked away from the closet. That's the thing about praying people. They have a closet. What Jesus talked about. That was what I was going to talk about this morning. Some. They have a place they go where they're most comfortable, where God visits them. I pray God will send some of you and burden some of you to do that. Wouldn't it be a miraculous, I don't want to say miraculous, wouldn't it be an awesome boost to this church for some of us to come before each other honest with the things that are in our hearts, like those prayer requests that we don't even vocalize and we tell people those things. And then somebody says, you know what, I feel called to really seek after God in prayer. And then five years later, some of those things to happen. And us to have the joy together of saying, remember five years ago? And look now. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's our message today. I pray that God would use it, that you would receive it uh, the way it was intended today. Um, I certainly hope God will put in me that desire.